I recorded apparently seven seconds yesterday. So we're going to give this another try. So I'm going to start this here that we're already recording. Let me just change things over to me for a moment. <coughs> Okay, there we go. Okay, well, thank you for joining for this uh, second attempt at teaching intro to tapestry weaving. And there, I'm gonna share, since we just had somebody else come in, I'm gonna go ahead and share the handout in the chat again. And with that. Okay, so I am Lady Serena Calandra in Adler's Rue, which is in the middle of nowhere in West, Tex West Texas. So we're going to talk about tapestry weaving today. And you know, most people, when you think of medieval tapestry weaving, you think about the unicorn tapestries. Those are very well known, and very beautiful pieces of work and very gigantic. And it's not very realistic that that's something that you're going to try to recreate. But I'm going to go over some other options that you can look at too for medieval tapestries that uh, are more realistic to try to recreate or do in that style. Because um, with the unicorn tapestries and a lot of the tapestries that you think of from the 14th, 15th century in Europe were actually woven by workshops of weavers. I mean, you would have groups of 20 to 40 weavers that would be working on that. And it would take one skilled weaver a month to weave a foot, uh, one square foot of cloth. And they're very fine and intricate. Um, but there are other cultures that utilize tapestry techniques. Uh, some of the oldest known tapestries are actually Coptic tapestries from around the 4th, 5th century that were found in Egypt. They tend to have Roman and Greek themes. And also, if you look at a lot of South American cultures, uh, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, uh, you know, looking at the Andean textiles, you can find a lot of examples of tapestry that's still uh, some extant examples. I tried to find some pictures of those, but I couldn't find some that I was comfortable with linking to here. But if you search for 12th to 14th century Peruvian tapestry, you will find a lot of examples that will come up. Uh, the examples that are in the handout are uh, from the Art Institute uh, page, and they have several other examples of Coptic weaving. You can also search for Coptic tunic and you'll find some samples of tunics that actually have tapestry woven designs into it. Uh, so that's something else to look at for uh, some inspiration on there. Uh, but tapestry weaving is actually pretty easy to get started with uh, on there. You don't need a whole lot of materials. I This is actually something that I started doing when I was in high school, long before I knew about medieval reenactment, I actually got a little Lisa Frank fiber arts kit that had a small little loom and some knitting and crochet things with it. And one of the projects was weaving a small little wall hanging with a heart in it. So that's when I started. And the heart's a good shape to start with, with starting to put shapes in because you get to practice doing angles and curves at the same time. Uh, with that, just to keep that in mind. Uh, so I'm going to go over some basic terms first. Um, first, what is a tapestry? So a tapestry is a variations on plain weave, but it incorporates putting patterns and images into the woven piece. And some basic terms to start off with that you need to know. I'm going to switch my camera here because it'll be easier to see with the other camera. moment. Okay. So the first thing to note is what is the warp? So the warp threads are the vertical threads that are going up and down on the loom. The weft is what you weave with that goes, usually goes across horizontally. Things that you would use for weaving, there's different things. So we have shuttles, which come in very many different shapes and that you can wrap the yarn around and pass that through, pass that through the shed. And there are weaving needles that come in many different shapes and sizes. We have wooden, plastic, they also come in bone and metal. Uh, 
I tend to use plastic because I lose them a lot and they're a lot cheaper uh, on that. Then we talk about the shed, which I had mentioned here. So the shed is the area that your shuttle passes through or whatever it is that you're weaving with, your, your needle or your bobbin, because you can also use bobbins. Uh, so I'm just kind of going through one direction here. So I have that flat, when I lay, raise it up, that's called raising the shed. And then that makes it easier to pass a needle through. And one of the things, another term that is kind of orphaned on that sheet is a shed stick. So I'm gonna demonstrate that here, what that is. So a shed stick is a flat device that you can thread through that if you're doing lots of area, an area, large area of plain weave, that you can, oh, I've got it off one place right here, but you have it in here, you can lay it flat. And then when you raise it up, it makes it easy to just stick the needle through or the shut or the shuttle through to pass through. And so that'll work for one direction and you can keep that at the top or it's also something that's good to use at the bottom for starting, starting your weaving too, to space things out. And we'll get to that here in a moment. Uh, now, if you do end up doing a shed stick, it's only gonna work for one shed. The other shed you have to manually go through with your needle and pick up going the opposite direction but it also makes it easier to do that too. Uh, normally though, I would, you would do that below the shed stick. It's just, this one doesn't have a whole lot of space left in it at the moment. So that's something that you may utilize at the beginning of your piece, because we'll have to do some plain weave at the beginning. So if you're using a pattern of any sort, you're gonna hear terms such as pick, pass, or row. And so those are all just different terms for the row that you're on on your pattern. And there are some patterns that you can find out there for tapestry weaving. Uh, some, there's a lot of tutorials that if you just search for that, especially on Pinterest, you'll get a lot of good illustrations out there on that. Another common term that you will see come up is called cartoon. So the cartoon is a line drawing of the pattern that you're trying to weave. Uh, in period, these were often uh, full color works of art that were magnificent works of art on their own that were commissioned from artists. But it's just something simple that you can draw up or you know, have somebody draw up for you if you need to. Uh, a good thing that you can start off if you're not into drawing is the Dover coloring books. There's a lot of them that have like the stained glass or nature or something like that. And they're black and white drawings. Those are good, a good thing that you could use that as a, as a cartoon to start for a practice piece if you wanted to. But what you do with that, uh, that cartoon that you have out on a piece of paper, if you have a loom that has space behind it, like a bar that you can tape it to, then you can tape it behind the piece. Uh, what was often done with larger pieces is that it was taped to the wall, either behind the piece or to the side of the piece, and that way you could see what was going on. Now, a lot of times though, you have, you, your design is going to be a mirror image. You need to make it a mirror image of what you want the, it to look like. Because most of the time you're gonna weave the tapestry from behind. And so that's why, you, excuse me, that's why you would need to have that mirror image. But if you're doing a small piece like how I have these looms set up, you could weave from the front if you wanted to, but it's just easier to weave from behind because that way when you go to bury your ends at the end, or things or having to start pieces, you're not having to keep turning your loom around to be able to make sure that your new thread you're starting is on the back side of your piece. So it's just easier to weave with the back facing you. And, okay. So just some things to touch on. If Right now you'll see the tapestry weaving is kind of having a little bit of a renaissance at the moment. Modern tapestry weaving is very different from period tapestry weaving. Uh, in modern tapestry weaving, you're going to see a lot of 
um, things like roving and different weights of yarn used in the same piece and all kinds of just more of focusing on texture and just kind of in curves and things like that. Not really a whole lot of figures, but you do see some landscape occasionally. And that's not really period of having the roving and things like that in there, but it does make a pretty piece. Uh, but there's the same techniques that you would use in both of them. And if, when I talked a little bit about other cultures, the Peruvian textile or textiles usually had a lot of geometric shapes and sometimes figures. You could see some gods that were depicted and things like that. Uh, uh, Navajo rug weaving is also actually technically a form of tapestry weaving. Uh, just to give an example with that. So getting started, uh, you need a loom. There are a lot of different things that you can use for a loom. There are commercial tapestry looms available. Shocked is one brand that has some decent ones uh, with things. There's one that I believe the brand is Kila that tends to come up pretty cheap. Uh, the reviews for it though are horrible because it's got a really bad tensioning device on it. So might wanna stay away from that. Murex makes a really good fine loom that it's also used for bead weaving, but it's got a really fine spacing on it with the metal coils that if you're wanting to do something very intricate, that that's a good choice there. But those are tend to be a little bit pricey. So on the cheaper side, there's a lot of options that you still have available. So one would be cardboard. Now there are actually cardboard looms you can buy. Um, I have this when I was teaching children's weaving and such. But you can, and this one was actually a larger piece that I cut off so that it only has the notches at the top, and that's fine. You can make your own with notches at both the top and bottom, make it whatever size you want, just make the notches evenly spaced. So that's the easiest, easiest one to get you started. But you can also use uh, pot holder looms if you have any of those around. Any frame loom uh, will work. Also, you can take a sturdy picture frame that has the glass, that you remove the glass from it. And you can use that because you don't have to have notches. You can just wrap around the frame itself. Uh, this is actually an ankle loom. It's a Windhaven accordion loom and double-sided. And one of the things that it even advertises that you can do with it is tapestry weaving between this bar and the top bar. And it, you can get, make wire coils to be able to separate your threads or just wrap it directly around the around the bars. And I'll show some ways in a moment of how you can make something like that work. Uh, another thing is I have a spring loom that I can use for tapestry. You just have to have something at a top and a bottom that you can keep tension with. And that's really the basis of what you need. And then we have, these are just simple little frame rooms. I got this kit from Hobby Lobby. I just bought them because they're easy to show for examples. And it was about five or six dollars, something like that. I'm not sure if they have them anymore. Uh, but in the children's craft sections is actually where you can usually find small little frame looms if you just want to try something out to see how it works. Okay, so getting started, the basic thing you want to start with is warping your loom. Now for your warp threads, you want something that is sturdy. Uh, cotton is highly recommended. Uh, there actually are some cultures in period that did actually use cotton thread for, for within the weaving. Silk and wool were commonly, were commonly used as well as linen. Uh, but with what you generally are gonna find readily available, uh, cotton is a good thing to start with when you're practicing. Uh, so if you have access to get rug, uh, rug warp, that's a, that's a good thing to do. Kitchen twine. Uh, also, uh, this is number three crochet cotton. Uh, this would work for a lot of things. What I have on my looms right now is number five, and it's actually too, it's too thin. I really should have used the thicker, but I just didn't know where it was at the time. And the basic thing for starting with your warping your loom is if you have a frame loom, you're gonna wanna tie the warp to the side a little bit. Uh, for this one, some of them that just have the notch, like the cardboard. Uh, if you're making your own, something you could do is punch a hole in the, the side a little bit so that you could thread your, 
your warp to it, have something to tie and anchor it. But if not, if you make sure you have a sturdy notch, because some of the homemade ones, it's not going to be all that sturdy. This is kind of a chipboard a little bit, so it's a little bit sturdier. But I just tie on usually on the top corner uh, with a couple half hitches. I like to have something that is removable so that if I need to increase the tension later, I can. Uh, if I'm using a frame loom, I usually will tie it on about a, about a couple inches down the side of the frame. So that way, as I'm weaving and warping things, if I need to adjust the tension, I can slide it down farther and tighten it uh, to increase the tension if needed. And so for this one, since I have no notches at the bottom, I have to warp all the way around. If you had one that did have notches on both sides, you can generally just loop it around the top. But warping all the way around on a frame will also uh, increase the number of warp threads that you have. So the more warp threads you have will increase the detail that you're able to get to make it more intricate. And so on this one, what I'm doing to increase that, because this one's pretty wide notch, is I put two in one slot. And you can do that with peg looms too. You can just loop a, a second thread in the same spot. So, and that will increase your threads that you have access to and increase your threads per inch. On this one, I really probably could do three. So I'm gonna actually do that for a moment and show you the difference. So in that one, I just put three next to each other. And so that would increase things. Now, something that is important is with this type of weaving, you want to have an odd number of warp threads. So you do have to make sure to count that when you get to the end, because if you have an even number, you're gonna have problems with alternating your over and under and it's not gonna come out right. So just make sure that you have an odd number when you're going through things. Now, how I would end things, is say on this type of loom, I always make sure that I'm not going all the way to the edge because I want because since you have to have an odd number, you usually are going to have one side that's going to have this thread, an extra thread showing that you're not going to use. And so I bring it over to the side and I tie it off just how I started with a couple half hitches, something that'll secure it on there. So that's the basics of getting started on warping. I switch the camera back to the looms. Okay, and what I was saying on going around things, so this one does have notches at the top and the bottom. So to increase my warp threads on here, I warped all the way around. Because um, this one, the notches are too they're too narrow at the top. They're not all that deep. So I really can't get a good thing by just looping around the top on this one. They tend to fall off. So that's part of why I have to go all the way around. Let's switch over to this one. Okay. And so on this, I didn't actually leave enough space here at the bottom. I probably should have left it up, moved it up a little bit farther but it's at least something that I'll be able to finish things at the end. When you're starting to tie on your, your weft threads or to start with your weft, you want to leave some space at the bottom because you need to have enough room that you can tie off your end pieces. And also same when you're finishing, you need to make sure you leave some at the top so that you can knot your threads together and be able to bury them in the, the finished piece. Some things you can do at the beginning to help set the spacing or the set of your threads. Uh, one is you can take a couple shed sticks and uh, which some other things that you can use for shed sticks are rulers, uh, but those tend to be pretty big or paint sticks. Uh, also, I've used knitting needles, just a couple, a few of those and at least two, two or three, and weave them, just weave them like how I showed before with the shed sticks down at the bottom, and just leave them in for a little bit till you get some weaving started. There are some other ways that you can do that, or set your thread, or the set of your thread. 
and one way is to do a kind of like a sumac knot or just it's kind of just a little hitch that's going to go around things and I'm going to show how that works here in just a moment. Now the thread I'm using for the samples is thicker than what I have on here right now just because it's easier to see with the camera. The thread that I do have, the yarn that I have on here that I've been weaving with, such as the blue and yellow here, this is Knit Picks Palette Yarn. I find that it's actually a nice little wool that works well with the tapestry. I'm about to use some cotton here for the moment to demonstrate. So I usually would start from the other side, but since with the camera, I'm gonna start with this side. Um, but I am amb ambidextrous, so that kind of works for me. So, you know, this works for left hand too. You can start with whatever side you're comfortable with and easy to work with. So when you're bringing on that first piece of thread, you do want to leave a tail that's long enough to be able to be buried into the piece at the end. So I just came under, under this thread and I'm going to and brought it over and now I'm going to go back under it again. So it's just a little loop. It's kind of awkward with the first one. Now if you wanted to tie a knot to start with, you can um, because you can bury it into the piece and kind of hide it on the edge and it's okay. Uh, as, you get, as you get more practice, you'll get used to not using knots to start things. So now I'm going to go to the next one. I went under the warp thread. And you can see how it looks like, okay, it's going under two at a time. Well, now we're going to go back around it to make the other part of the little knot. And we'll see in a moment that it kind of looks like just making little S-shaped things around the threads. Get extra things caught up in the same time. So you can kind of see it's just kind of makes these little loop things. But that helps set the set of the threads, the distance between your warp threads and will help set that. And you would do that all the way across. And something that would be good is also to go back and doing the knot the opposite direction that you did this first knot. Now this technique can also be used for outlining areas because you can set things up at an angle like that. Back to the other loom here. This one, you can see that I did that in this raised texture here and here. This one I did from a different direction than I did this knot. And so it gives a little bit of a different texture, but it helps set up the areas. And then now on modern weaving and such, you know, of course, leave that as the front side and you have your textures. Um, but as I said, it's not really all that common with anything period to have that. And I've got a straight thread here. But if you turn it the other way, you don't see the knots very well. You can tell a little bit of difference, but it still helps be able to set up your different areas when you're trying to weave and help maintain your shapes a little bit. And so that's one way to start. Another thing that you can do is take a doubled up piece of thread or yarn and you can kind of chain things on, like wrap things around and just kind of just kind of double and do a knot around each thing. You see I've got a tension issue on this side and that's where I can slide my knot down a little bit. And I could actually tie another knot tighten my tension, as I was saying earlier with that. So there's just some ways to start with that. Now starting a thread, 
starting your thread for weaving. Let's do that side. As I said, you can tie a knot to begin with, but you do want to leave a tail to make sure that you can bury that end in there. So it does not matter what side of the loom you start on. Whichever side is comfortable for you is where you want to start. And it doesn't really matter whether you start over or whether you start under, as long as you remember to follow the same pattern all the way across of under over or over under, as long as you're consistent on that. Um, now this one, now I usually do start over under, but because of how my previous threads are on here, I don't want to cause too much issues at the moment, so I'm going under. And sometimes that is easier. So I'm just going to go over part of the way here. Now when you're starting a piece from the beginning, you do want to do a couple inches or at least an inch of plain weave. That will help set your threads in place at a good space and then also will allow that when you're finishing that if you needed to turn over, turn under part of the bottom to finish or at the top turn down a little bit and stick a dowel rod through it, that you could do that. So I'm going to start, I'm just leaving this tail off to the side. So now my next row is going to be the opposite of what I just did. And then because this, this last one I'm going over it, I'm going to start by going under. Now, tapestry weaving is a weft face weave, which means that the warp th or the weft threads should cover the warp entirely. Unlike most ankle bands and tablet weaving, which are weft face, or I'm sorry, warp faced. Warp face means how you warp things determines your patterns. But on a weft face weave, your weft, the thread you're weaving with, are going to form your pattern. Now, see, I just kind of naturally started pushing that down and skipped over a step here because it becomes instinct after a while. So, what you want to do to when you're bringing your threads, your, that second thread through, to help maintain your tension and to get things set right, you need to do what's called bubbling. So leaving this up a little bit, I kind of tend to just push it down a little bit. You don't want to pull it super tight because if you pull too tight, which is I know is most people's natural instinct, you can end up pulling the whole thing in like this. See how it starts to pull in? And then you can't really get into that space that you need to. So you need to make sure to leave space and a little bit of tension. I try to fix that there. If you look at a lot of examples out there of people doing tutorials or tapestry weaving, or sometimes you'll see pieces where it's on the loom. If it looks like an hourglass, that's not what you want. You want it to be nice and even and straight. It does take some practice though to get that. Hourglass will happen a lot when you're when you're beginning. So that is that's normal on there. Now with that bubbling, you're gonna want to beat things down. So there's different things that you can use. This is a tool called a beater. They come in many different sizes and shapes and materials. You can also use a comb if you need to. I have long fingernails, so I use my fingernails because that's easy, easy enough for me on this type of piece. Uh, but I could just pack that down, beat that down is what they call it. I can know a little bit more space, but there we go. And I am trying to intentionally leave a space between the that part down there at the moment. Okay, so as I said, you want to do a few different rows of that plain weave first. 
Now, there are some different ways of uh, different patterns and things that you can create uh, besides trying to do shapes. A simple thing to start off with is just trying to add some dashed lines. Now, how you do that is remembering that two, two rows of one color makes a solid line of that color. So we'll call that color A. So you want two rows of A will make a solid line. Then if you weave one row of B and then two more of A, you're going to get a dashed line. Now you can use that concept to create other patterns too that can help in defining areas or creating different uh, subtle shades if you're using different colors. So like here, I used a column or hatching method to create an illusion of being crops in a field. But you can use that also, uh, say with, you had red and blue next to each other or uh, Red and, uh, red and yellow. From If you're using a really fine weave, a really fine warp, from a distance when you step back, those colors will kind of blend together and you'll see the pur purple or orange to create different effects. Uh, so if you're using different shades of the same color next to each other, you can create some subtle shading uh, with that. And how I created how these were going one direction and then another, and getting the, just the straight columns is weaving one row of green and one row of brown and alternating till I have the column up to the size of the height that I want it. And then, uh, so I alternate green and brown and then weaving, if brown is what I ended on, I would weave one more row of brown so I have a solid line of brown going across and then go back to alternating the green and brown. And that's what will change the columns of how they're stacked on top of each other, that will offset them by just having that one row of a solid color and then going back to your alternating. So that's simple ways to get some shading. You'll know, see some of those terms called just cross hatching or hatching in there uh, or columns. Then there's the fun stuff of creating shapes and creating your figures. There are many different ways of trying to incorporate multiple colors into the piece on how to do that. Now, for that basic way with just having the two lines, I would start one color on one side of the loom and the other color on the other side of the loom. So blue on one side and yellow on the other. And weave, and, and weave them that way. But we're gonna discuss some other methods here and some other ways of trying to add in your, your yarn. So something that is common that you will see in a lot of Peruvian weaving and also Coptic weaving, you'll see the term slit weaving. So you can see my fingernail goes through there because there's actually a hole. That's okay. If you're making something that's not meant to be a, you know, a wall, uh, used as a curtain tapestry to keep, keep the draft out, that's fine. But this was a common method that was used. And that's how you can create anything when you're seeing anything that has really sharp edges that look clean, there's usually a slit there. And every few rows, or every once in a while though, you do have to join the slit. So I've got this right here is where they joined up and then right here, but there's slits here and here. So I'm gonna show how you can join the different areas. There are a few different ways of doing this. Uh, I have demonstrated good uh, teaching moment here of yarn likes to entangle itself. Uh, wool really likes to attach itself. To try to keep things organized, uh, some things you can do is you can get bobbins. Tapestry bobbins look just like uh, bobbin lace bobbins, only they tend to be usually a bit bigger, but you can use bobbin lace bobbins if you want, if you're using some fine threads and you have those around. Uh, they have a space where you can wrap, wrap the, your yarn around it and they have a pointed tip to make it easy to weave in and out of the small spaces. 
Another thing that you can do to separate things out, um, and to keep things organized when you're not using it, is to butterfly the ends. So I'm gonna, I've got a, a tail going across my palm here. I wrap one around my thumb, another around my finger, and I'm doing a figure eight around it. And then I can take that original, the thing I started with, and wrap it up, pull it down. And actually I'm gonna make a, just a little half hitch knot to tie that in. And then I can take that off. You've got something to keep your yarn nice and neat. Um, you can weave with this on its own too. I just prefer to have needles, but it makes it, it slips out where you can pull the yarn out easily. But that's one way to try to maintain things because you're going to end up keeping several threads at once going here. Um, that's why it's also helpful to have a lot of different needles. Hey, it's Kelly. Hi. Um, I just look, look, warn you, it's, uh, you have about 15 minutes. I oh, know actually you, you wanted 45 minutes. We're now four minutes out then. <laughs> okay. And I just wanted to help keep track of time. Okay. Uh, Cause there is I one question as well too. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, I see it. Could you do okay. the knot on the side for a peg loom? Yes. Most of the peg looms are going to have space where you can do the knot on the side of it. You can also make your own peg loom with four pieces of wood, attach them together somehow that they work, screws or nail and, uh, well, some screw probably would be the best way. And then you can use nails to create pegs if you'd like. So that's another way to do that. Okay, so we're gonna go over the first method of trying to link areas of color. Now you do generally need to build up areas around it before you start something. Now it's okay that like here I have one thing that's going up higher and that's okay because we're gonna show a way that we can go back and incorporate that. But you don't wanna start something up here with nothing around it to anchor to it. And so this first method I'm gonna show here is going to be an interlacing. Now you can weave um, both, both pieces at the same time, this one coming, the, say if I had the gray coming this way and the blues coming that way, because you do want them to be in opposite directions. Um, but sometimes I like to build up a little bit farther. So what I'm gonna do is there's this loop here. I'm gonna, I'm coming up from the bottom. And now, that is interlaced into that section. And I can see, and mistakes happen. I can see that I actually made a mistake on my over under. Um, I'm not gonna fix that at the moment. I'll go back and fix that later. Just for the demonstration, but it's important to notice that when you see that, and they're coming up soon. But you can see, that that does not form a slit and those are attached together. So that's one way that you can do it. Another way is called dovetailing or stacking. You'll see both of those terms come up. So on that, instead of trying to come up through the loop there, it would be going in between. So I just went in between two gray and putting a row of blue there. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back on this next pass. I'm gonna go up, so there's a gray. I'm gonna go above that one and put the blue. Now you can do it also where say you did two rows of blue, then two rows of gray. So stack two blue on top of each other, then do two gray. So that's your dovetailing. If you look at uh, 
wooden boxes with dovetail joints. You see where, you know, you can distinctly see how it forms the little squares and meets up. Well, that's the same concept with this. So you're alternating in there. So those are two common methods that you would use. Um, on my slit technique here, what I did were periodically, I, where I joined the areas, that was done with an interlacing to help get, maintain the structure of things. And you just see that little subtlety. If you look at the handout, there is a picture of an acorn. That one, if you look in the orange section, you can actually see some sections where you can see the stacking, the double, the dovetailing. On where the brown and green meet, those are interlaced uh, in some of the areas. And then the gray on the acorn cap, that's actually uh, sumac knots that I showed you at the beginning of uh, wrapping around to give some texture on that. And a few other knots in there do. I used some different techniques on that one. Now there's another thing that you can do to create some subtle changes and it's called, um, one term that I've seen for it is called meet and depart. And so this is an example of how these were formed. And so I'll demonstrate that here in a moment. So you can get some nice good points and things and shapes. Uh, something else, uh, you know, see how that's going that way. You could turn it up and make that the size side of your piece. A lot of period tapestries actually were woven on the side. So the pattern's going a different direction. So say if they intended that this is the direction that their picture is supposed to be, but they wove it this way. And then when they're done, they're gonna turn it up like that. So this is a good way to try to get some flames or other geometric things in there. So for this, you need to have two colors at the same time. I'm gonna switch to the other loom. You're gonna have one going, coming from the right and one coming from the left. So let me weave this one back to the other side. So I have that going there for you. bubbling going there. Adjusting my tension. Okay. So I have one on one side and one on another. I'm just going to get another needle here. Okay. So I'm going to weave that one just a little bit in there to a certain point. Bubbling, beat that down. And then this one, I'm going to come from the other side. Okay. So the meeting at the same point here. Got this one thread here, right in the middle. So only one of them is gonna cross that thread. And we're using that as their meeting point. So I'm gonna use the blue for that. Now this is another way of, that also is kind of stacking, but it's a little bit different than what I just showed. Now I'm going to weave the yellow to go back. Actually, oh, I missed a step there. That's okay. Because that actually was starting to form a slit again. Take 
that out. Any mistakes happen. And you just fix it. Okay. Oh, it's going over that, but it does. That was the stuff that I was missing there. So I do need, we have right there where they're meeting. So this one needs to go over there, but it also needs to go under the yellow. So when you're meeting them, one does have to go into the territory of the other color there. That's what I was missing. Okay, so I'm gonna go back this way because if they didn't cross over, that's where you get the slits. Have the yellow go back that way. Okay. So then when I bring, this time I'm gonna go do things a little bit differently. So I'm leaving one less, leaving less threads over than I did on the previous row. Because I'm gonna bring the blue approaching over into the yellow a little bit farther. So that was the last yellow. So I need to go over that one and then do my return pass, which I did make a mistake on the weaving. I'll just show this for the purpose though. See how each time I'm going over one and that's making this line go farther out a little bit. So those are the basic methods of how you can join different areas. Now, you may have the question of how do you add something, say you're running out of thread in the middle and you need to add a new thread. So you can, you know, if you can get it all the way to the side, you can change it there, just like how you started on a new piece in the beginning. Um, the only difference would be that when you're starting new when you started a piece on the edge, something that is helpful to do that you can do sometimes is take the pull the tail up a little bit, and when you weave the next couple rows, and just incorporate it on the side, include it as part of the weaving. Like don't include it in your over under account uh, count. Just make it be part of this thread right here. Um, that's one thing that you can do. Another is if you run out a piece in the middle, say if I was running out of the yellow right here, I could take a new piece of yellow and start it back just a few more threads to about say right here and just lay it on top of the new one. Weave it exactly the same over under pattern as the one that you're ending. Uh, so I would go Just like that. Well, okay, but not from that direction. <laughs> and weaving makes things easier. So if I was replacing, starting a new one, I would just come back through. And do it just like that. Say if this was the middle of a piece. So you would have your old one and new one laying just right on top of each other. That's the only time that you really would do that. And you just need to do it for a few threads and then you can lay in, and that's how you can lay in a new one. And it's not very noticeable. I actually have that down here in the brown where I've done that. And I can kind of notice the spot, but generally from a distance, you're not gonna see that. And if you're using wool, then it will meld onto itself anyways and you're good. 
Uh, some finer threads, though, may be more visible if you're using that uh, method. So it is sometimes better to have it on the side. Though I wasn't very neat on my side here, but I plan on binding this with uh, some ankle trim, which is not really period, but this is also not a period piece. So it just depends on what you're doing. But if you did have rough sides, when you finish your piece, you can always just turn under your edges and stitch that down. That is period doing that. And that way you'll hide your rough, your rough ends on there. And you can start a color in the middle like these. Uh, some ways that you can do it is just bringing your piece, your new thread in and leaving the tail and then just trying to be mindful of it to start off with that you don't pull it all the way out. Uh, you can trap it a little bit like, like I did on the edges here and just weave a little bit up and catch it on a couple rows. Or you can take the end and after you weave two rows or so, take that end and then bury it in the piece. So I'm gonna demonstrate that. I know we're about at, almost out of time here. Or about at an hour. <laughs> Let me demonstrate that. Okay, so when you have your ends that you gotta do something with them. And I'm gonna use a different needle because that one doesn't work very well for this purpose. Okay. So all those loose ends, you've got to hide in your things, in your piece, just like with crochet or knitting. So I am just sticking that down a few rows. And then I would just cut that off. And there you go. So you can do that in the middle of these things too. Uh, that's where, remember that, what I was saying about be mindful of your front and the back. So you want to make sure that you're burying your threads on whatever's going to be the back side of your piece. Now finishing a piece and getting it off the loom. So our last major step on here. I tend to like to start with taking either the bottom off or the top off, not both at the same time. Now, because you want to be able to have something still anchored holding things on. I actually find it easier to take the bottom off first. Some people prefer the top though. It just depends on your loom and your preference. So I would end up cutting these pieces as close as I can to the bottom. And then you're going to tie knots to secure them. Now, on the bottom here, I took groups of three and tied overhand knots on there. On the top, as another way to do things, I did groups of two and then one of three, because you have an odd number. I just tied uh, double square knots. Now, then you have to take those ends and bury them in the piece like I just showed on the edge piece. And then that would secure everything. Now, sometimes people will turn these into fringe and tassels, but I actually find it's better to go ahead and bury your warp threads in and then add threads for tassels if you're wanting to do a fringe. That'll make your piece sturdier. And that is the basics of creating a tapestry. Do you have any questions? It doesn't look like there's any more questions. I'll probably have someone to actually start doing it. I'm sorry, what was that? I'll probably have some questions once I actually start doing it. Uh, well, I'm available. You, you know how to reach me if you have questions. Um, and I can be found on Facebook. Miranda Moore is the best way to reach me because I do not respond to my email for the most part because I get too many spam. So I don't usually catch anything that's sent there, but I will catch messages <laughs> on there. Um, 
and that handout's at least a good start. I'm not the best at writing things out. I know that. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of tutor tutorials that are available. There are also some good books available on Kindle, some of them that don't cost a lot, and some free ones that have some diagrams. Uh, if you're wanting uh, some good examples of some period pieces and, well, just a lot of textile information in general, uh, there's a book I believe it's called 5,000 5, Years of Textiles. That's something like that. That book is absolutely wonderful and has great pictures and does have some beginning diagrams of weaving there just as an example to explain some things, um, but has a lot of a lot of different examples of tapestry and many other textiles on there of different embroideries and things like that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, Kelly, if you want to go ahead and stop the recording and Thank you for joining me today. I hope 